So, um, really glad to be here. So John asked me to make a presentation, and so uh, I, I had to say yes, and I'm really glad to do it uh, in Singapore. So the, the, the theme of our main event in Paris was the new API stack, right? And so um, I, I've decided here to present, like, what's the new API stack, what you should care about, and actually what's also the mindset that you need to have to understand this new API stack to implement it tomorrow in your company. So a little bit about me, uh, I'm the founder of APLS Conference, but I've also founded a company called OAuth.io, you know, the authorization protocol, uh, right, framework, that has been acquired one year and a half ago. I do also some writings, uh, just wrote a book about APIs, I do some teaching in business schools about the programmable economy, uh, and I'm a European Union expert on APIs for governments, right, so I try to help the 27 governments of Europe to open APIs let's say to open data via open APIs better than uh, CSV or Excel files, right? <laughs> so, uh, so this is me, this is my recent publications. So the book on the left, Continuous API Management, right? And also some state of the banking APIs market, also state of API documentation and other things. You can download everything, everything on apidays.io, so the website of the, of the conference, right? Last but not least, because we will use this a lot, and you have an example here as a poster. This is the API industry landscape, right? This is the 500 API tools companies, right? That defines what I call the new API stack, and so we will use that. But again, you can download that from apidays.io website, and so you'll be able to follow the presentation or later, uh, uh, thanks to that, uh, that, re that uh, landscape, right? So a few things to consider before, right? Few things to understand the, the technology stack, right? The first thing is something that happened in 2002. In 2002, Jeff Bezos, the richest man in the world, actually he's getting a divorce, so he's getting half of it. <laughs> but uh, actually it should, it should worth $35 billion, the, the divorce, right? But, so he sent email to all employees of Amazon, right? It's called the Jeff Bezos mandate. Who already have heard of Jeff Bezos' mandate before? Yeah, some people. So the Jeff Bezos' mandate is like, his, it's an email he sent to all internal employees, right? And he said that now all team needs to communicate via APIs. It's, it will be an obligation, right? No other communication will be allowed directly between IT teams and between product teams and IT, right? No Excel file, no database export, nothing. It has to be via service interfaces. It's an obligation, right? It's an obligation. So you can read the, the, you can read the, the whole thing. The most important thing here, okay, I will remove that, yeah. The most important thing here is that sentence. All service interfaces, without exception, must be designed from the ground up to be externalizable. Not to be externalized. To be externalizable. That is to say, the team must plan and design to be able to expose to the, the interface to developers in the outside world, no exception. That means that we never know if a customer may want something from us tomorrow, but we know our internal employees may need it tomorrow, right? But if we do it as good as if it was for a customer, we will be a lot more agile internally. So he was the first to think that the concept about APIs as a product, right? To be easily consumable with a great developer experience, right? And so that's the first really to, ther to make a theory about that, right? right? So if we deliver APIs internally with an experience as good as if it was for a customer, when we will be ready to open, it will be easy, right? It will be, it, it will be really fast to open to a customer. We just have to switch to say, oh, it's just an external user with more access control and done, right? And that explained also the success of AWS, Amazon Web Services, two years later, 2004. Amazon was probably not the best to do infrastructure, but they had the best APIs at the time, so it was easy to integrate when you were an external customer because they were already using it internally, right? So this first step, Understanding that all APIs should be thought to be externalizable is the first step to understand the new API stack, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, good. The second thing that's important to consider, it's what we call op, uh, API descriptions. So, you know, to describe APIs between each other in a company, some people were using, like, sometimes Word documents, 
sometimes like a, a specific description format like Waddle, like in XML, like a web application description language, or WSDL, web services description language, right? But let's say it was, there was no a common way to describe APIs, right? So a, a new format called Swagger, right, in 2012 has emerged with other in the same time, RAML and uh, API Blueprint, right, to describe APIs. But describe them in a way that is machine readable. So if human can understand APIs, but if machines can understand API, we could generate tooling, right? If a machine, if a robot, a program can understand an API description, we can generate a lot of toolings, document, developer portals, testing, monitoring, management, just because the system understands what the API is doing, right? So for some who doesn't know maybe what's an API description, so an API description document, an, API, an open API document is something a little bit that looks like that on the right, so it's some JSON or YAML, right? It's some, some, some text, right? But on the, it's a version of the document, some information about APIs, and then you have all the resource, right? The URL, the URIs, the operations, the methods, right? Get, post, put, delete, patch, right? And then you have all the input parameters and all the output, oops. Okay, let's go back, right? Yeah, and then you have, okay, good. Then you have all the response outputs, right? And for each endpoint, you describe it like that, right? All the inputs, all the outputs for each path parameters, right? And at the end, you have a, a, a program that can understand that. And, you, and then, because of that, you can make really complex workflow that generate a lot of things. A lot of things about what we call the API lifecycle platform, right? API lifecycle management. So, so our friends from Good API made a kind of explanation here. So, yeah. So this is the API implementation source code, right? But you can see there is a lot of things that can be completely produced by that, right? You have the developer portals here, right? The API monitoring, the API analytics, you know, and so. You, a lot of things can be generated by that because now these programs can understand what the API is doing. So they can generate a lot of things, right? So it's a certain things to consider. Because we have API descriptions, a new ecosystem of tools has, has been able to be built because of that. Right? The last thing, it, there, ha there has been a lot of cons consolidation on the market the last years, right? So I just, I just made a, a, a sum up of all the acquisitions. So CA Technologies has acquired Layer 7, Rescom, Veracode, and Blazemeter. And CA Technologies has been acquired by Broadcom right, recently. APG was acquiring user grid, for, and, and, and Google acquired APG and Firebase, right? IBM acquired Strongloop and Data Power, and soon IBM will acquire Red Hat, right? <laughs> so it's on the process, it's not like, a, it's, uh, it has to be validated, but yeah, so the acquisition is here, right? And Red Hat has acquired a three scale and API management solution. Salesforce just acquired MuleSoft. Axway acquired just three weeks ago Stream Data. So, so there is a lot of acquisition, right? So a lot of consolidation because every company was doing one part of the stack. And now every company wants to do the whole stack, right? So just, just to consider, right? So now we can dive into the, the deeper stuff, right? So the new API stack that we will see later is about that, right? New business concept. API first, building the API before building the application, the website, the integrations, and the, de and, and the device integrations, right? API as a product, as we saw with uh, Jeff Bezos. New IT concept, so API first architecture, experience API, API facade. When you have a big technical debt, you make an API facade, right, to, be, to become to be consumed by applications, so little by little, you can refactor what's behind the interface, right? You can cut it into microservices, but you keep the interface as the contract, the unique contract, right, for application to consume. So you can refactor what's behind, right? Using facades as a middleware to refactor big monolith, right? So that's, that's a new API technologies. So you've heard about REST, you know, uh, using uh, HTTP. Uh, inherent uh, um, uh, characteristics to, for API. GraphQL, gRPC, Kafka, you know, new technologies, we will explore that uh, right later. New API cybersecurity challenges, right? So most of the, some APIs are protected by API keys. 
some a little bit more by OAuth, like the tokenization of APIs. But then on top of OAuth, OpenID Connect has been has emerged, right? You also have a, a user managed access, Yuma, which is also a new protocol based on OAuth 2. And then you have all the two factor authentication, the SMS, the one time password. So a new security stack is coming, right? A new complete security stack. New API driven regulations, PSD2, obliging all European banks to open APIs, right? That changed a lot of things, right? So regulation is the base, base of the stack, right? You have to respect that. <laughs> So even in, in, uh, in user data, GDPR, HI7 for healthcare, GS1 for logistics, so many regulations are coming for each industry. And in Singapore, you have regulation coming for banking, right? Soon, right? At least the discussion. So new industries, right, that are disrupted, but new open source tools. We'll talk about that, but there are new open source stack that is coming. Okay, let's dive into the... The content, so we will, in the landscape, this is what I call API as a product, but we will look at this part of the landscape, right? What I call the API tooling, right? So it's the below part, right? The 350 tool. We will do one by one, right? We'll go one by one, but just to say, this is where all the part of the API lifecycle are represented right here. Security, monitoring, management, testing, documentation, Streaming, PSD2 banking APIs, developer portal, strategy, serverless, mobile backend as a service, subscription, iPass. Again, you will have a copy of the, of the poster you can find online, but just to say, everything is there to cover the whole API lifecycle. Let's dive into the content. So the new API stack is for the new API lifecycle management stack, right? So in the book, in the book that, that I wrote, we, de we declare the 10 pillars of API management, right? API lifecycle management. The 10 pillars are strategy, design, documentation, uh, development, testing, deployment, security, right? Okay, I, have, I remember them. <laughs> Monitoring, discovery, and change, right? So this is the 10 pillars you need to master. You cannot master all of them perfectly, but you need to know, you need to cover the maximum you can on, on all this stuff, right? And it's a kind of an iteration cycle. So let's begin with strategy. So strategy, concept, it's really important to not think about the best business model for APIs, but what are the best APIs for a business model, right? right? That's big change, you know. Xero, did you see the presentation of Xero? They may not want to monetize APIs directly. They want to be a platform for accounting, to do more accounting, right? They could monetize some APIs, right? Making a few millions, but they can make dozens of millions by, doing, by making more accounting, right? Important to understand that. So the API can be the product, like Stripe, Twilio, transactional APIs. The API can support the product, like Salesforce. You know, you have a CRM and you, like Xero, you have a, a, you have a, a, a tool that you want to use APIs to make it bigger. The API can promote the product, like some uh, media APIs, because you sell advertisements, so you want your content to be everywhere, right? And the API feeds the product, right? On mobile phone, when we upload a photo on Facebook, yeah, it's to feed the Facebook feed, right? No, so that's the idea, right? What are the best API strategy for your business model? Not the best business model for your API strategy, right? And again, you can have a lot of business models based on that, right? A lot of business models. So on the left here, so it's APIs. It's the free APIs, like Facebook, right? Sometimes making the API free will give you a lot more money because people, you will make your APIs more known, right? And so at the end, they will go back to your platform. The developer pay for the API, right? So, you know, you pay to access data or services. You can pay developers to use your APIs, like a broker, right? Like, a, you know, Google AdSense, you know, for example, or Amazon affiliate program. So if they use your API, and if someone buys something, you get 4%. So if you actually, you pay the developers to consume your APIs, right? And the last one is the indirect revenue model. So when you, when you have internal monetization, for example, I know some companies, if you use an internal API, the company, the team who build the internal API gets 50,000 K. Of course, you saved money by reusing an internal asset, right? So that's internal monetization. So for this strategy, 
you can find people here in the landscape. We have a API strategy consulting companies. And also about the, the integration, because there is an important decision also to make on strategy. What do you accept to integrate in your system? Right. It's also an important decision, right? Important decision. So we call it the API abstraction or API aggregator, right? Or the iPaaS or integration platform, right? If you want the data to be integrated like by a, like a IT procurement, yeah, you may want to use this platform instead of having 50 or 100 different APIs to integrate without consistency, right? The second thing is design, right? On the design part. The design part, it's important to consider the full level of consistency for your APIs, right? Your APIs needs to be consistent on this, in the same, you know, between, uh, with itself, right? If you have uh, 20 endpoints, you know, the, the data representation, the resource needs to be consistent, right? But then if you have 20 APIs in the company, not just 20 endpoints, 20 APIs, APIs needs to be consistent with each other, right, inside the company. But if you are in a specific industry like banking or logistics, you need to be consistent with the industry. And you need to also to be consistent with the general common practice rules, right? Don't invent a new authentication protocol. Don't do something weird, right? So design is really an important aspect. And you will need to define with the protocol, the format, and the vocabularies of your APIs, right? So I really recommend you to go there, which is apistylebook.com. There are some open source API guidelines from Adidas, from PayPal, from Google, from Microsoft. They open sourced their API guidelines so you can be inspired, right? And so like that, you can find in the landscape uh, API design companies in the API management part. But to name a few, there is a Apiary Oracle, right? Uh, there is a, 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 most of the API management, right, are doing that, that like the AWS2, MuleSoft, IBM, you know, Kong, Tyke, they all have kind of API design tooling inside the platform, right? Axway and um, most, most of them, like, they, they have it. Then you have the documentation, right? Just, we'll check the time. But documentation, so this is documentation, right? So this is documentation, yeah. <laughs> when it's hard to know if we have to pull or push, yeah, we need to put documentation. So documentation will always compensate by design. No, this is bad design, right? <laughs> but, the, but if you have great design, uh, let's say document, you can focus documentation of making things easier for developers, right? So there is two parts in the documentation. The part I call the teach don't tell and the tell don't teach, right? The first is the tell don't teach, right? Mostly API reference, general concepts, just for people to know what's in, like a dictionary, right? You, you cannot learn the language with a dictionary, right? It's really hard. You need to understand the context, right? The context is the teach, don't tell part, right? This is where you put tutorials, sample codes, sample applications. So it's a little bit like the tell, don't teach is like a brick of Legos without instructions. And the teach, don't tell is a, a part with instructions, right? So people can have a lot of imagination, but they cannot be, but for people who need to be inspired, you can give them, you know, the, Instructions, right? And so like that, you will be able to have great uh, documentation like Stripe, you know, with a sample code and, and uh, documentation in every language, and, you know, and, and, and so that, that's easy. And you will be able to find that in the API docs part, right? There are companies like readme.io, uh, there are companies like Appiamatic, which are a sponsor here, who help you to make great, beautiful documentation, or Stoplight or others. You will be able to find them here, right? Then, I will, I will put that, the three into, into one, but you have the development part, the testing, and the deployment, right? So one, part, one important thing about the testing is that, let's say the API testing, you know, you do, you, sometimes you will do unit tests to be sure every function is working, right? But you do that to, to know if, a mist where, if a, there is an error coming, it will go from in the pyramid, right? You know, and then you have the API layer tests. You do all your API layer tests, and then you will, if all your API tests are good, you will know if the problem comes, it comes from integ in the integration test. And then like that, at the end you have the UI test. But the API test is really a layer in the testing, right? So you will be able to find API testing here, with a specific part, but again, most of the API management have 
an API testing part, right? The deployment, the deployment is the fact that you are able to deploy the API you know, on some platform, on-premises, on or directly in the cloud. So you will find most of the deployment here in the cloud serverless or Databell GraphQL backends, right? It's how do you deploy APIs? Are you cloud first? Do you deploy on, let's say, scalable uh, uh, elastic cloud, right? So that's also a way to, to think about that. So all the tools you need will be there. Then you have the security part. Security, when we talk about security, right? You know, we talk about API keys, auth, tokens, two-factor, multi-factor authentication, one-time passwords, even hardware <laughs> device, right? There is a lot of things about security coming, right? There's a lot of things. And you need to adapt your security, uh, let's say, to two things. The level of security you want to have, but also the user fatigue. Because too much security, it's hard to implement, right? It's boring, right? It's difficult to adapt that. So you will have to find, uh, I've seen many banks, for example, they have like between four and nine level of security, right? So depending on the criti how the application is critical, they say, oh, you're level three security, you're level six, you're level nine. Level nine is also most of the time a hardwired <laughs> connection between the, the two systems, right? Still happens. Security will be able to be fine in the API management, you know, because of the acquisition, many API management solutions own the security, the gateways directly into their system. But you have also an access level and identity management part, right? Called also IAM, like identity access management, you know, so like that. The monitoring, the monitoring is really understanding what, what part of the APIs are slow or down before your users, right? So that's, that's the goal of API monitoring, right? And also the analytics what we call the KPIs for APIs, to know exactly who is using what, where, when, for what kind of applications. So like that, you will be able to see the, the weak signals of your ecosystem. Oh, look, we have this small startup that is beginning to have like 100 calls per hour. Hmm, what they're doing? Are they scraping our website, right? Or let's say try to scrape data from, from our APIs, or are they actually doing something that is meaningful? because they are buzzing and we need to follow them and we need to copy later, right? So we need to understand exactly what's, what, what's behind that. There are some platforms in the API monitoring part, like API metrics, Renscope, API science, you know, some companies are doing that, uh, especially about, you know, doing only API monitoring, like BlazeMeter and some companies like that. Go a little bit faster because uh, I, uh, I, want, I don't want to be too much over time. <laughs> the discovery part, so the discovery is mostly based today because of developer portals, right? So developer portals can be, can be found either in the API management or in the specific developer portal section, right? It's a way to expose APIs to developers, right? Like a developer.0.com or, you know, api.whatever.com, right? It will be a way to expose all the APIs you have, right? But I want to show you a specific features that someone told me about. So now we look about APIs on developer portals, but what if we find APIs directly on search engines, right? So it's, some, it's a new feature that someone uh, showed me. It's directly in Google search, so it's in beta test right now, but I don't know if you see. So it's one of the beta testers is uh, Arab Bank, right? So this is Arab Bank developer portal, but I don't know if you see here, but you have account information APIs, access customer specific account related information through O3 and OpenID, Try the API documentation. Payment API, you know, initiate and submit direct payment securely. Try the API documentation, geolocation API, exchange rates, product information. So the API is directly in the search engine. And I think it's a game changer, right? I think it's a real, real game changer. Because now you will look for something and the APIs will be directly in the search engine, right? So it's in beta test right now, but expect it to be uh, soon, right, there. For the technical part, they do it by uh, using JSON LD. So for people who, who know that. The last one is the change, the versioning. Actually, versioning, there is no real tool to do versioning, right? There's no real tool. Actually, in most of the API management, you can version API. But let's say it's, it's, it's a, let's say, a craft practice, right? It's not a directly tool to do that. You do that with, uh, you can do that with uh, virtualization, which is the kind of testing part, right? So to finish, 
This is kind of the landscape. Again, download it so you'll be able to see everything uh, there. F one point about GraphQL, because GraphQL is really trendy these days. So GraphQL is not a specific uh, technology. It's just a query language for APIs, mostly based for mobile, right? Who have heard about GraphQL before? Yeah, well, well half of the room. So, uh, you know, with REST, you know, you have to make a lot of requests to, get, to access data. You have to get data, specific part, to get specific resource and get another resource and get another resource. So there is a lot of back and forth between the mobile application and the server, right? And when you have low connection, this back and forth can be really chatty. So Facebook invented GraphQL, which is one query language, to request all the data you need in only one call. That's the idea. It's not like SQ, SQL or SQL you know, for APIs. It's not a language, right? It's, a, it's not a directly SQL, but it's a query language for APIs. So that, that is really trendy in the developer world, so you should think about it. Uh, it's really easy for developer to use, right? The only concern is that sometimes when you don't know who is using it, right, the, let's say the data model that you are putting into graph may not be scalable across the whole organization. REST is great because when you don't know who is using it, you, know, you, you, have the, you own the server, but you don't, own the, you don't have control on the clients who are consuming it, right? This is why you make resources. With GraphQL, you have, let's say, more, uh, let's say um, a coupling between the two. So that's great when you control the both, like you control both sides, but you can have some drawbacks when you don't control that. But it, great. Look about it, a lot of people are using it and they love it. Save them a lot of resources and time. So check if it's the, if it's the best technology for you. I'll finish with this. Uh, if, if you like, like open source, you can also build your open source API stack. Right? So I put some here, right? but you can find them in the, in the thing. But API design, documentation, gateway, microservice, testing, ops, identity, and developer portals. A lot of people have real open source like a free software, right? A free software version that you can use, right? You know, so that's, a, uh, that's something to consider, right? That's it for, for the stack. Again, you have a, an example of the poster. You can download the poster, and I will post the slide on, on, on Twitter in, in a, like less than 30 minutes, so we'll be able to have everything. I hope it was insightful to open the technology track. And I hope you will enjoy uh, the day and the conference. Thank you very much.